Well, while in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, going through the ceremonial cleansing, Paul was spotted by some Jews uh, from Asia that were familiar with Paul's preaching about Jesus and grace and no longer being under the law, uh, which they considered heresy. And these Jews kind of started a riot with Paul in the center. And it was such a great commotion uh, that the Romans noticed and they went in and detained Paul. Uh, and they were, uh, and while, as they're leaving, Paul asked if he could speak to the crowd. And in a moment's notice, with no forethought whatsoever, Paul does an outstanding job. Uh, speaking to the Hebrews in Hebrew, he shared his testimony. He explained uh, how he had witnessed Jesus. He, he just told them what happened to him. Uh, he com- he uh, communicated his encounter with Jesus. And it was all good until he shared his mission, uh, his assignment, his task that God had given him. And, uh, you know, all believers collectively are referred to by God as the church. And God compares the church to a human body with with all the different parts uh, working together in unison for the common good. And Paul's part of the body was to reach out to these Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And uh, and so it was all cool until he got to that part. And you, you see, the Jews considered everyone else unclean. Uh, they felt as though the Jews... Uh, were God only were God's children alone, and and everyone else would be like an infidel. I guess today is what they'd probably call them. And so, when they heard Paul express his mission that God was interested in saving Gentiles, uh, when they heard this, they just went off the deep end. I mean, it was it was like it was like Paul simultaneously slapped all of them across the face with a two by four or something. I mean, they just freaked out. They went berserk. Uh, they wanted Paul dead right then and there, and, and the Romans. They haul him off, uh, Paul off, protect him, and, and they don't understand what the big deal is. They think they're missing something. And so the plan was to torture Paul until he gave them the logical reason for this large cr- uh, crowd going crazy. And, and Paul was, is stretched out in bonds, and he's about to be scourged. And then they remind him that, uh, or Paul reminds them that he's a Roman citizen, which meant it was illegal to flog him or beat him without a fair trial. And so uh, they stopped. And so the next day, uh, the Romans released Paul to the Jews uh, so he could appear before the Jewish council. And so, uh, as we talked about last time, Paul did such an outstanding job sharing his testimony, uh, just reporting his encounter with Jesus, defending his faith. And that's where we get the word apologetics. It's apologia, the, this defense, giving reason. And Paul did this in a moment's notice. And uh, and now, though, he's had all night to think about it, and he stands before the Jewish council, and he's not defending his faith. He's, he's not giving a reason for the hope within him this time uh, like he did the day before. This time, Paul proceeds and try, to try and defend himself. Uh, he doesn't tell what Jesus had done in his life. He tells what Paul has done in his own life. And just in review, in chapter 23, uh, looking at verse 1, it says, Paul looking intently at the council, uh, said, Brethren, I have, lifted, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. And then in verse 3 it says, Then Paul said to them, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit and try me according to the law, and in violation of the law order me to be struck? And uh, so this was a little different tactic than the day before. The day before, he told about his past. He explained his encounter with Jesus. And then he was beginning to explain how his life was different now that he had known Jesus. And and if he had not been interrupted by the riot, uh, there's no doubt that he would have continued uh, or completed telling about his new life. Uh, All of this on a moment's notice. And, And remember, Jesus, after telling his disciples that they would stand before kings and rulers, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. And so after a long night, Paul on this day basically says in one verse, I'm good with God. And then uh, in verse three, he says, you're going to hell, basically, and and not exactly giving a reason for the hope that's within him, is he? And uh, and as I thought about this, you know, Jesus kind of expressed himself in two different ways as well. To the sinner, to the person that knew they probably weren't right with God, Jesus offered grace and mercy and forgiveness Uh, But to the self-righteous religious leaders that were convinced they were right with God, Jesus would inform them that they were mistaken, you know, that they were not right with God. 
And, and I suppose the lost people today could be grouped in these two classifications. You know, those that admit they've gone against God and his ways. And those that are kind of under delusion that, that they're such good people, there's no way God uh, would have a problem with them. Or that God just doesn't even exist. That, that they don't have a problem with God because he doesn't exist. Either way, they kind of fall in that group. They're good. Uh, no need to worry about them. Well, when people realize that they're sick, uh, most of the time they're very interested in, in hearing about the cure. And, and that is, is our job. And it's really cool. In 1 Peter, if you want to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3. Towards the back, almost to Revelation, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 15. Peter says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So that is our job. We're told to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. The hope is the cure to eternal death. I mean, that hope is Jesus Christ. Uh, but when a person doesn't know they're sick, uh, when you don't think you're sick, you know, the cure to something that you're sure you don't have, that's almost the very th last thing you want to hear about, right? I mean, you don't want to talk about it. The only thing you despise worse is someone trying to tell you that you're sick and dying. Uh, when you don't think you are. And, and fortunately, that's not our job. If you look in uh, John chapter 16, and I think these, we won't be all over the scriptures today, but John chapter 16, in verse 8, Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples. And he says in verse 8, and he, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So once Jesus left, the Holy Spirit was given the task to convict the world. The Holy Spirit makes the conviction. And this word convict in the Greek is el, elcho or elogcho. I'm sorry, I'm not a... Greek scholar here, but it, it means to expose, convict, and reprove. And it's used 17 times in the New Testament, and it's translated into English in these different words. Convict, convicted, convicts, expose, exposed, rebuke, uh, refute, reprimand, reprove, reproved, and show fault. Uh, so Jesus says the Holy Spirit will be the one that convicts, that exposes, that rebukes, that reproves, that shows fault to the world. And, you know, I've encountered people in need over the last several years, and some of them blame their circumstances on something physical. You know, they, I lost a job or unreliable transportation or no place to live. And they ask for help. They ask if, if I would ask God to give them a job or a car or a house or 20 bucks or whatever, and then they're good, they say, you know. Uh, they say, I, I just got tripped up, I just need a boost back, and then I can handle it from here on out. And I, and I try to explain to them that God so often uses hardships in our lives to get our attention. Often hardships are the only thing that will get our attention. And, uh, uh, you know, telling them that there's a mu there may be a much bigger underlying issue here, or there is a bigger underlying issue, but they don't want to hear that. And, you know... Uh, and I'll tell you, I haven't seen much fruit from those people like that. Uh, and we still love them and we still help them out. And, and it's planting a seed or it's watering a seed. Uh, it's trying to be the face of Jesus to them. And prayerfully, there may be some fruit of the, in those people one day in the future, you know, as the Lord uh, works in their heart. But then there's others that come uh, needing help and they're already convicted. You know, the Holy Spirit has already convicted them. They know they're sick. And we get to offer them the cure, you know, and then we get to see the fruit grow. And, and what an awesome thing that is uh, when we get to see that. And so uh, we're, we're, we are told to correct and reprove one another, other believers, in love, you know, with their best interest in mind. Not our own best interest, not to rub their face in it or anything like that. But in love, uh, we're told to do that with other believers. But with the world, we're, not, we're told not to judge them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, we're told to give a reason for the hope that was is in within us. 
uh, with gentleness and with reverence. Uh, we're told to offer the cure. And to those that are sick, to those that the Holy Spirit has convicted, some of them accept the cure, and it's an awesome thing. To those that don't know they're sick yet, uh, it's like planting a seed, I guess, or watering a seed. And so when the Spirit does convict them, uh, they already know where to get the cure. Uh, they know they need to go to Jesus to be cured. But telling someone they're sick, uh, no one wants to hear that. I mean, they don't want to hear they're sick, and none of us do, even in a physical sense. Uh, and including the Jewish, Jewish council here, and that's kind of what Paul does. And so Paul realizes that, man, this is not going to end well here. And so uh, he brings up the resurrection of the dead, and he, and, and which is, he's talking about life after uh, physical death, you know, which half the council believed in, the Pharisees, but the other half did not, the Sadducees. And, and so needless to say, it kind of caused this big uh, commotion. They got arguing about this and kind of took Paul out of the middle. And, uh, but this big commotion happens, and the Romans rush back in, and they take custody of Paul once again. They, they save his life again. They protect him. And, uh, and so Jesus uh, has saved Paul's life through these Romans uh, in two, twice, in two days in a row. And the Lord confirm, confirms that in verse 11 of chapter 23. He says, But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. So Jesus has plans uh, for Paul in the future. He's, he's not going to let him end, his, his life end right here. And, uh, and it's so awesome that Jesus stood by Paul's side. And you know, Jesus, he is standing by your side and my side. He stands by our side, even in the midst of, of terrible circumstances. And so that brings us to chapter 12 of Acts verse 23. Or chapter 12, I'm sorry, verse 12. Of Acts, of Acts chapter 23. And it says, When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And for and we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. So these 40 plus men, they band together to kill Paul and they make a vow not to eat or drink until they kill him. So they're not giving themselves a whole lot of time. And I mean, it's just hard to imagine uh, just how far men's hearts can get from God. Uh, men that profess God. It's hard to imagine, but it's real. Uh, the people that represent God uh, are, the, are the ones that the enemy is after. And unfortunately, the enemy wins way too many battles, and he overtakes us so many times. And I, I can hardly fathom a group of men coming to me and the elders and saying, hey, we've taken a vow that we're going to fast until we murder this guy, and and uh, and so we want you guys to, to call them in for some counseling, but, you know, don't worry. We're going to run them off the road on the way here and murder them. I mean, yeah, you're going to say, yeah, that sounds like a great plan, you know, straight from the heart of God, right? Uh, what time should we arrange this little deceitful murder plot here? Uh, it's hard to imagine other people sinning like this until we kind of stop and look at ourselves and, and the stupid things that trip us up. And uh, we are all so vulnerable and, and uh, without desperately holding on tightly to Jesus with both hands, we are sure to stumble and do some stupid things. We might not take a vow to murder someone, but we might do some stupid things. And we do from time to time. Well, he continues in verse 16. It says, But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Lead this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me uh, to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. Verse 19, The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, 
For more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one that you have notified me of these things. So it's interesting. Paul has a sister and a nephew, obviously. And this nephew hears about the plot on Paul's life. And he goes and reports it to Paul. He goes and tells Paul. And I find this very interesting. What does Paul do here? Uh, We know Paul's a man of prayer. We know Paul credits everything good that happens to God. But notice upon hearing the news, Paul did not immediately call for a prayer meeting. Jesus had just stood by his side informing Paul that he was going uh, to be given the reason for the hope within him in Rome. So Paul knew he wasn't going to be killed. Uh, so why do anything? You know, why not just blow the threat off? I mean, God's going to protect him. We know, we know that. Uh, but it's very interesting. Sorry, my the humidity is uh, holding my pages together. Uh, so Paul knew that God was going to protect him. In, in fact, God had protected Paul twice, right? In just these last two days, so God saved his life twice. Uh, but who did God use to save Paul's life? He used the Romans, didn't he? And I think Paul sees how the Lord is operating here. And we know Paul encourages us to be in constant state of prayer, you know, always uh, prayerful uh, to God. And so I'm sure that he he felt that God intended to use the Romans once again to save his life. And so we're not told if uh, Paul got on his knees in prayer or not, but we are told that Paul informed the Romans because he knew they would not allow it. And uh, they had saved his life twice in the last two days. And so he knows they're not going to allow this this plot to take place if he could just inform them. And uh, if you haven't noticed, God is in the business of using people. Uh, God is the orchestrator and, and people are like the tools in his hands. And unfortunately, we don't really compare to a professional snap-on or Mac tool set. We're, we're more like the China set you know, that you get at the dollar store. Uh, but but nonetheless, God likes to use us, and uh, God likes to use people, and and we like to be used by God uh, to do His work, don't we? And the Bible is just full of examples of God using people to accomplish His purposes. Some even don't even want don't want to be used by God, like Jonah. Some don't even know they're being used by God, like uh, Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, But God has given us brains and he's given us gifts and he's given us abilities so he can use them. Uh, Let me just give you an example. If if I'm out in the yard and I'm I'm cutting up a tree with a chainsaw and I and I slip and I accidentally cut my leg off, you know, uh, and Jill hears me screaming out there in the yard. uh, What's she going to do? Is she going to be prayerfully dialing 911? You know, oh, oh, dear Jesus you know, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, and, and uh, Lord, let the ambulance get here quickly, and, and uh, Lord, guide the doctor's hands to, to uh, reattach uh, Rob's leg. You know, or is she going to say, oh, and go into the house and, you know, open up the laptop and, and uh, turn it on and watch, you know, how that little thing just goes and goes and goes. And, and then she's going to send out a, a group email. Hey, guys, church, we're going to have a little prayer meeting. Rob just cut off his uh, leg in the yard, and he's bleeding out. Um, you just go, if you want to bring a dessert, that would be awesome uh, for afterwards. And uh, he, he's, he's looking a little pale out there. But uh, anyway, uh, and then, you know, everybody comes over and, and lays hands on me and, and uh, we're healed and going for dessert. Well, not that God can't do that. I mean, could God reattach a leg with a doctor? Of course. No problem. It would be nothing for him. Could God fix a car without a mechanic? Sure he could. It's nothing. Could God prepare a meal without a cook? Yes, he has. He's prepared thousands of meals. We saw him feed, you know, thousands of people. Could God be worshipped without musicians? Of course. Could God teach his word without a pastor? Well, I don't know about... Well, of course. Of course he can, right? It's nothing. He doesn't need uh, me or anybody else. None of these people, none of us are necessary for God to accomplish his work. Yet God desires to use people. So much so that God is willing to use a less than perfect tool set, a far less than perfect tool set. Uh, tools that are sometimes unreliable. 
tools that are get lost easily, tools that don't fit the application quite right, tools that are rusty, tools that are cracked and broken. God likes using tools. And I'm not saying not to pray. Heaven forbid, like Paul says, we should be in a constant state of prayer. But if you think about it, what takes more faith? That God would just provide a brand new vehicle in your driveway, you know, as, as an anonymous gift, and I've seen that happen. Or that God would be able to use that barefoot shade tree mechanic in his overhauls to fix your transmission with a rusty pair of vice grips and a crescent wrench. I mean, so that he has enough money to feed his family that night. What takes more faith, really? I mean, I've seen God provide anonymous gifts, and it's an amazing thing. But I've seen some people that claim to be mechanics, too. And and for me, it would be much harder to trust God to use that shade tree mechanic sometimes to, to be touching my vehicle. And God uses people. He loves to use us. He loves to make us a part of what he is doing. And it's so awesome. And even though we are all less than perfect, and we all make mistakes, and we all mess up sometimes, you know, we, we strip the bolts out on the transmission until, you know, Bubba gets back with the, the new set of tools from the dollar store or whatever. But uh, somehow God uses us anyways. And even though we're less than perfect tools, we're being held in the perfect hands of God. And He is in complete control of the situation. God is in complete control of everything all the time. Always. He's always in complete control. So when things don't look great, when when things are unknown, we just need to trust God. Uh, He's going to take care of it. Don't be focused on the less than perfect tool that God is using. Focus on the perfect hands of God that are holding that tool. God is always with us and he is faithful. Even when we are faithless, God is faithful. He's always there. And so we need to trust God as he uses people in our lives and all different kinds of people in all different occupations. And God loves to use other people in our lives to accomplish his work. But also, God uses us to accomplish his work in the lives of others. Sometimes we feel so unqualified. But, but think about it. What glorifies God more? Him fixing your car at the new state-of-the-art technical center? Or God fixing your car in Bubba's backyard? You know, don't sell yourself short. The less that we are, the greater that God is glorified through that. And He loves to use people. And so, if you're a person, and I think most of you are here today, if you're a person, God desires to use you in incredible ways. He desires to use you, and He will, if you will allow Him. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank You for being our God. We thank You for this this example, Lord. And Lord, we just ask that You would be with us as we just bring everything to You in prayer, Lord, but that we would be open to You using other people in our lives. And You use so many people. We see You doing that day in and day out. And Lord, help us to be open to you using us in other people's lives, Lord. And we know we're less than perfect, and we know we're so unqualified sometimes, but you still desire to use us. And Lord, help us. Give us the confidence to allow you to use us uh, for what you're calling us to do. And so, Lord, just speak to our hearts. Give us that direction. Give us that uh, prodding. uh, Lord, make it clear to us how you want to use us this week in the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.